All right. Thank you and welcome all to Free Speech, Public Policy and the Technology Industry. This is an R Street event. I'm your moderator and host, Chris Briley, Senior Fellow of Internet Governance at the R Street Institute. Delighted to have three uh, fantastic panelists with me here to talk about a subject that is the, the topic of many events in, in Washington, D.C. these days, the role of uh, government and platforms in moderating online content and, and online activity. Uh, it's, a, it's a very hot topic, not just in the United States, of course, but also in the European Union, in India, and in many places around the world. This particular event is part of an ongoing process that our street has been conducting for the past uh, over a year, in fact, and, and uh, before my time, um, to look at how we can bring different stakeholders together along the frontiers of public policy thought in this space on how we can approach user content management online. We have an objective here of increasing a shared understanding of the things that are being done today to help mitigate harm online, the effects on the overall ecosystem of those activities, and to sort of share ideas and thoughts with each other about the possible role and complications of regulatory reform and greater government intervention into the space as well. So from a process perspective, what we've done with this project thus far, uh, we have developed a, um, a number of, uh, not, not with the four of us, mind you, but with the broader project of which our street has been a part in which we have brought many stakeholders in uh, over the past several months. We have put together a sort of a starting place, a, a thought, a set of thoughts about how we scope talking about this in a constructive way, as well as a, a few points of consensus that seem to be fairly widely held among uh, policy stakeholders and thought leaders in the space, as well as some propositions, seven specific propositions for areas of further attention. So I'm going to hold the, the moderator's prerogative here and, and lay out some of that context as a way of level setting, both for, for us panelists who, who work in this every day and for the audience to help understand where this often very technical and difficult conversation from a, from a, a governance point of view, um, how, how we can talk about this all in a more constructive and, and uh, level, level way. So, but after that, I hope today's public discussion will bring a lens of uh, industry and even ecosystem level thinking to questions of online content intermediation, which is in contrast to an event from last month, which focused the discussion through the lens of the individual. Um, I'm seeing a comment in the chat that uh, one of the participants is having trouble hearing me. Um, uh, my fellow panelists who I can see on camera, can you hear me okay? Or is there any problem with my audio? Okay. I'm, I'm not sure then, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but I can't, I can't uh, figure out what's going on then. Uh, so let me go through the content that the multi-stakeholder process that our street has been leading, uh, has developed thus far. I mean, it starts with four points of what feel like general consensus through this conversation. The first, which I think is particularly important, is that what we expect when we talk about how to manage online content and the harm that can arise in that context must not be perfection. So the standards and the expectations for what we're going for is not the total elimination or end to online harm, because frankly, that's impossible. I personally uh, use cybersecurity as a metaphor for this. If you think that the goal is to make everything perfectly secure, you are doomed for failure. In the same way, the goal here is not to prevent people from um, engaging in, in harmful activities online because we can't do that with either technology or with public policy. Rather, it's a matter of continuing to improve and iterate and work to mitigate harm as best we can. The second point of consensus is related to that, which is that what we're talking about today, which is content management and practices and policies for content management, does not resolve deeper challenges of hatred and harm. These stem from people being people online. At best, what we can hope to do is reduce the use of internet connected services as vectors for the channeling and the amplification of that hatred and harm. The third and fourth points of consensus both relate to the role of automation. Automated processes, generally uh, artificial intelligence aided, machine learning and, uh, and intelligence uh, processes that operate in this ecosystem have a positive role to play, but do not themselves represent a panacea or a complete solution. Um, with all due respect, uh, AI is not going to fix these problems, not by itself. And finally, the fourth point is that automation carries its own risks for internet users' digital rights, including rights to privacy, free expression, and freedom from discrimination. And it's important to be mindful of the complex yet important role that automation plays in this, which is why it factors into some of our propositions for, for further attention for discussion. The first of which is uh, downraking and other alternatives to content removal play a very important role in this space. And so we've identified some positives and challenges and ambiguities 
inherent in digging into this in more depth. Cutting against this overall objective of increasing our shared understanding and really trying to take a conversation that is often very heated and very political and put it into granular and substantive policy terms so that we can make some progress on it together. The second and the fourth are related. The second is granular and individualized notice to users of policy violations. And the fourth is uh, more clarity and specificity in the content policies themselves to improve predictability and how they be implemented at the cost of flexibility. We see these as related because there's an, a, a bit of a trade-off that can happen sometimes between more general policies that are more flexible and more specific policies that become uh, can become rigid and brittle in some contexts. The third of our propositions thus far is again around the use of automation, as I mentioned, to detect and make classifications of policy content, such as filtering. The fifth proposition is the use of friction in the process of communication. These social media platforms and other user uh, content management and communication systems are designed to really encourage free and frequent use. And there are uh, increasingly ideas to slow that down a little bit in certain ways as a means of encouraging thoughtfulness by users and to manage some uh, potentially flagrant behavior along the way. The sixth is to see more experimentation with and more transparency into how recommendation engines filter the content as it is presented to us and reorder it and package it in ways to deliver a better user experience or for whatever reason they may be pursuing. There's a lot of experimentation happening in certain uh, services online with how we weight different pieces in these systems and seeing more of this experimentation has the potential for positives, challenges in realizing those positives and ambiguities in how you design such an intervention. And finally, the seventh proposition that we've teed up for further exploration is whether and how, if so, to separate out treatment for paid or sponsored content online versus organic and free user-generated content, and whether or not you should review that from some sort of a higher standard when you think about policies to review it. That is me talking far more than I would like to. It is time for me to hand it over to my excellent panelists to uh, get them to speak for a, a brief period of time if they could. Um, please give your name, your affiliation, and, and, uh, and a short sort of reaction to how you see the space right now. And particularly focused on the lens of industry and ecosystem impact, what is it that you would most like to have drawn out and highlighted in this very rich conversation? So first, if I may, I'm going to hand it off to Lauren. Uh, from uh, I'll, I'll let her introduce herself. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you to R Street and to, to you for putting this really important conversation together. My name is Lauren Krupp. I'm the Council for Technology Policy and Advocacy at the Anti-Defamation League. ADL has been around since 1913, uh, fighting hate and anti-Semitism and knowing that where people go, hate follows. In light of that, we've been working to fight online hate since the mid 2000s and doubled down on that effort in 2017 when we launched our Center for Technology uh, and Society. So all of this is, is um, an incredibly important pieces of conversation. And I think that one area that I wanted to hone in on specifically was that point of consensus regarding content management, not resolving deeper issues of hate and harm. Absolutely true. Um, and that's something that we believe. We don't think that um, a per, even a perfect internet content management system would mitigate the real and deep and pervasive hatred that we've seen for so long. Having said that, I do want to emphasize that we're seeing a normalization of hate and extremism that we haven't seen um, in, in recent history. And I do think that social media um, and content management specifically has a role to play in that. ADL um, looks to, you know, looks no further than January 6th as an example of this. Uh, we've said that the insurrection at the Capitol was one of the most predictable terror attacks in American history because it was planned out in the open on social media. Our Center on Extremism um, identified of the 500 people who were arrested, 107 had extremist connections. So that means over 75% of individuals did not have extremist connections. So it's really this normalization, this pervasiveness and amplification of hate and extremism, where I do think industry and government and civil society have a role to play, even though absolutely as a point of consensus, those deeper challenges will still exist. Um, looking forward to talking about a lot of other things that you mentioned, really, really grateful that we are getting to a point of understanding points of consensus, understanding priorities, and then looking through those challenges and opportunities. So thank you, and I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Lauren. Matt, if I may. 
Uh, Chris, thanks so much for um, having me as part of this conversation. It's wonderful to see you in this quote unquote new role. I know you've now been in it for a while um, doing some of the things that you do best, which is um, bringing people together and trying to raise the level of dialogue and encouraging depth in conversations that need it. So it's wonderful to see you doing that work and thanks for including me. Um, I'm Matt Peralt. I'm the director of the Center on Science and Technology Policy at Duke. And I think what I'm most interested in in this conversation is how these principles hold up in light of the fact that in this ecosystem, the challenges we face and the remedies that we are seeking are not just about a handful of companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple. Um, the question I think we have is how we create a better internet for all, which means not just targeting a small set of companies, but thinking about um, about how things look for the ecosystem as a whole. Um, in that vein, I think that all of your principles hold up very well relative to the current debate that we're having in Congress, which I think is often somewhat divorced from um, the conversations that tech policy experts are having in forums like this one forums that, that our street's hosting. I think the divergence between those two things is really interesting. There seems to be a consensus, I think, often within the tech, tech policy um, community that is really different from the dialogue and debate and policy solutions that are being proposed right now in Congress and in the press. Um, still, I think, even though I think this the, the principles that you have are, are, I think, far superior than the debate that we're seeing in Congress. I do think some of the principles are stronger and some strike me as somewhat weaker um, in terms of thinking about how they would affect the ecosystem as a whole and not just um, companies with better resources. So my sort of rough typology of that is that the ones that struck me, at least on the surface, as somewhat stronger are things like down ranking, that was um, pr Proposition 1, Proposition 4, which is clarity in policies, and then probably Proposition 7, which is differential treatment between paid and organic content. It seems to me like companies with a variety of different levels of resources would be, be able to make progress um, in implementing some of the components of those propositions, um, you know, regardless of the resources that they have. I think things like notice and automation are more are likely more challenging. Um, those I think are things that you typically need bigger teams, more engineers to implement in practice. Chris, you can tell me if you disagree, I'd be really curious about your views on that, but it seems to me like those are a little bit more heavyweight. Um, and then I think there are a couple um, propositions five and proposition six, friction and recommendation engines that I was a little bit less clear to me how to categorize. And I think that those things might be really interesting to kind of test out in the field and see how do those play out in terms of um, what which companies are really able to implement them in practice and which aren't, and does that break down in some way across big and small. Um, so thanks again for having me. Excited to be part of this conversation. Thanks, Matt, both for your kind words and for your uh, and your immediately digging us into the substance here. I, I want to I want to be clear up front um, that the content that that I outlined out front is not an R Street position. It's really us pushing exactly for the purposes that Matt said, so that we can have real dialogue around these ideas. And and these, by the way, I did not write these. These have been uh, drawn from this process thus far. Trust me, I have plenty of my own ideas, and I continue to work on those, and and will be uh, continuing to develop those as well. Um, but I really want to use this uh, forum, this process, as a way of channeling um, the the that community that you referenced, Matt, the community of policy experts who's really starting to think about this in depth and think about what constructive solutions are. And particularly, I appreciate your highlighting of the discord that we often see between that and the political, as distinct from policy, conversations here. Though we could also all just buy theme parks, and apparently then everything would be okay. Uh, on that note, and to and to draw from Matt's reference to the internet is far more than Google and Facebook. I'd love to have Kate uh, introduce herself and, and say a few opening thoughts. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Chris. I'm uh, super excited to participate. So my name is Kate Tamarello. I'm the executive director of Engine. Uh, Engine is a nonprofit based in DC that works with a network of several thousand startups across the country to advocate for pro-startup, pro-entrepreneurship, pro-innovation policies. Um, and when it comes to content moderation and content management, I think uh, to just echo Matt's point, most of my job is reminding policymakers that the internet is not entirely three companies uh, and decisions made to get at those three companies will actually have pretty significant impact on the rest of the internet. And that includes the, the thousands of companies we work with um, that host user-generated content that often isn't social media. Um, and so doesn't really have a lot of the same problems that social media companies have. Um, so I think that's kind of an important piece of context that often gets glossed over and, and appreciate having the chance to voice that here. Um, in terms of the, the kind of consensus points you presented, I think two of them are really important and kind of 
very obvious to those of us who think about this full time, but somehow um, just get glossed over all the time in policy conversations. The first being that there's like no perfect here. Um, I think there's this weird misconception that if if we just nerded harder, we just built better tools and thought a little bit more about this, um, companies could kind of find all the bad stuff and only the bad stuff and get rid of it and the internet would be fixed. Um, and that's just not, uh, for many reasons, that's not the case. And so I appreciate that kind of being one of the main starting points. And then also just to your comment on kind of the role of automation, I think that's another, I mean, similarly overstated thing. Um, you know, there's a time and place for automation, but it does come with risks and it's often super expensive and time consuming to do and something that's out of reach of most startups uh, and something that they kind of have to like build towards but can't start with. And so um, appreciate kind of the recognizing the realities of, of automation is not being a silver bullet here. Uh, so yeah, super excited to, to jump in. And, and I think uh, you've laid the groundwork for a really good conversation. Thank you. And just uh, for the audience's awareness, I'm going to start by asking a few questions and we'll have some conversation amongst the panelists and then we'll take some questions from you at the end. So feel free at any time if you think of a question to drop it into the Q&A uh, as part of this presentation. I believe you should have access to that now or you're also welcome to drop it in the chat, but Q&A will be an easier format for me to keep track of everything that's being asked and, and make sure that we can get to your question in due course. Let's start with one question of mine though. Um, I'd love to hear the panelists take on the state of play of harm mitigation online um, from, from each of your perspectives. So I'd love to have all three of you weigh in if you could. It, it feels to me like there's been a lot of movement over the past couple of years, probably because of the amount of public pressure and the many conversations that we've had and bills introduced that would do very significant things to the legal and the regulatory framework. I've seen a lot of uh, movement. Um, where have you seen positive movement in harm mitigation online? Or if you would rather, I'm happy to say, where have you been hoping to see more movement, but haven't seen what we've needed to in the ecosystem? So feel free to take either side of that as you see fit. Any volunteers to go first? All right, uh, go ahead, Lauren, thank you. Sure, no problem, happy to hop in. And, and I do think that what, what Kate and Matt were, were speaking about, which is that the dynamic nature of this space and the hyper-focus on uh, big tech specifically is important to draw out. At the same time, I think that, you know, this is this is the benefit of all being in conversation together because some of where I do think that um, there is maybe some positive movement but needed improvement really is focused on that, that big tech space. And we can walk and chew gum at the same time, no question, we can create better policies and a better ecosystem across the board. Um, but focusing a little bit on big tech for a moment here, I think that over the last year we saw um, history unfold before our eyes and a lot of promises made by big tech platforms about improving and changing policies, but really inconsistent enforcement. And I think that's an area where I hope that further and, and deeper and more positive and equitable movement could take place. We, like, I, like I mentioned, uh, policy changes and promises, um, especially around areas of hate and harassment online. According to ADL's latest research, however, um, a lot of experiences of individuals and specifically Americans experience online hate and harassment had relatively same levels of identity-based hate uh, and feeling targeted by that hate um, in, in, on mainstream social media from our 20, January 2020 report to our January 2021 report. So 59% of African Americans, 50% of Asian Americans, 33% of Latinx people um, all reported experiencing some sort of race-based harassment on the platform. I have other statistics, 57% uh, of Muslims, 31% of Jews, 45% of LGBTQ plus individuals, I can go on and on. And, and what I'm getting at here is these really high levels of identity-based harassment are still taking place in spite of stronger, stronger policies, more transparency, um, you know, product improvements. And so that is to say that I think that, uh, again, a policy or a change is only as good as, it, as its enforcement. And we're not really seeing that. So that's my hope is to, is to really push further on transparency and also equity across the board. You know, what are what are policies, what are exceptions to those policies and how is that impacting individuals as they, um, you know, as they navigate those spaces online? That's that's one area for me that I, that I hope to see um, some improvement in. Thanks, Lauren, I appreciate that. Matt, please. So um, I, I guess I would applaud most companies for, I think, really signaling that they care. I think as the, as the 2020 election um, approached, for instance, the number of changes 
and innovations that um, companies were putting into their platforms on kind of a, almost a daily basis was sort of immense and I think reflected a real sense. Um, I think it was evident externally and used to be how I felt when I when I sat within Facebook that people, whether the companies were um, doing everything correctly or whether they were quote unquote solving the problems, they really were trying and putting a lot of energy into into trying to and into trying to make their platforms better. Um, I would sort of actually swim upstream a little bit in response to this question and say that I actually think that incentivizes a lot of things, or there are lots of incentives in the system, I should say, that I think are problematic. And it's not clear to me, I think obviously we want companies to do better in harm mitigation, but I think we have some, prob some um, challenges in how we scope the problems that lead to companies doing problematic things. And I typically think of this as sort of a numerator issue versus a denominator issue. All content moderation failures um, are potential press stories. Anytime there is crappy content that makes it out into a platform, that is a press story. Anytime there is, um, there is good content that is censored, that is a press story. And so we read a lot about these numerators. We read all the evidence that, con that companies are failing in content moderation. But, but platforms that host user-generated content are always going to have problematic content on them. It's sort of a nature of what a user-generated content platform is. And they're always, I think, going to have mistakes in, in their efforts to censor and control the content on their platform. So I don't think the, the existence of numerators that we don't like is evidence of large scale problems. Uh, it's often reported that way, but we often have these numerators without the denominators. So of all the content that appears on these services, what percentage of it is hate speech or what percentage of it is, um, it is problematic in some way. Um, and I think th that is more, those tend to be, I think, better metrics for thinking about how companies are succeeding or failing, looking at the overall universe of content. Numerator stories, I think, are problematic for one particular reason, which is they lead companies to try to do things to address certain cases that don't necessarily reflect the full scope of content on the platform. And so we have a report coming out shortly from our center at Duke that looks at the political advertising bans from Facebook and Google during the 2020 election. And our preliminary, um, the, the evidence that we have, our preliminary conclusions are that they really did very little to actually suppress misinformation on those platforms, but they probably did a significant amount to suppress important speech, particularly responses through lots of um, smaller, um, less well-resourced campaigns to respond to campaigns that had um, vast organic content reach that didn't need to pay to get their content out to many people. Those changes, I think, by, co by companies certainly weren't a response, I don't think, to a short-term business imperative. Giving up political advertising wasn't good for their business. And I don't think it was in line with most of their product goals either, which is typically to facilitate Inform, uh, sharing information, expression, um, those were responses, I think, to, um, to a narrative that I think distorted what really happens in political advertising on platforms that made it seem like political advertising was primarily about misinformation as opposed to helping to mobilize voters and get them out to vote. The response to that, those numerator-oriented stories, was to take steps on free expression that I think were really problematic, that I think probably on balance really suppressed good speech that we would want to see on platforms. And so I think the question which asks, um, are they doing enough to address harm, may in some ways push us in a direction where platforms actually would take over aggressive stances on content that results in pulling good content out of the ecosystem rather than ensuring that it's there. I very much appreciate that perspective. Thank you, Matt, and thanks for, I, I always welcome swimming upstream. Uh, Kate would really welcome your, your thoughts here, particularly as the numerator question will fit very differently for engines members versus larger companies for whom they just assume 20 or 25 new stories that put them in a, in a harsh light will be uh, made available every day. Yes, yeah. So Matt talked about incentives, and I think those incentives are even stronger for startups. If you get one bad news story because one bad piece of content slipped through, or on the other hand, right, you get one news story because you accidentally removed something that wasn't bad content, suddenly your, uh, you know, all of your users might easily leave in a way that they might not leave Facebook. Um, so I think that's like another um, another weird misconception about the DC conversation about content moderation is this assumption that like. Nobody wants, nobody has is incentivized to do well already. Um, and at least the companies we talk to are super incentivized to do well. And that's something we hear from startups directly. And I would say maybe to your question, that's kind of my, my answer. I think there's been a lot of positive movement for newer companies who are baking this stuff in at the outset. Um, I remember like privacy by design conversations, you know, eight years ago uh, and, and all these companies kind of waking up and realizing we didn't bake privacy in at the beginning and now we have to retrofit it. Um, a lot of the user-generated content hosting companies we talk to who are startups, 
might not have, you know, even 10,000 users yet, but they know that eventually uh, their platforms could be used for bad things. And they're thinking about that ahead of time. I think the, the scalability question is a really important one and, and one that these startups have trouble grappling with. You know, if, if you have 10,000 users and a hundred posts a day, that's doable. If you have 10 million users and a million posts a day, it gets a lot more complicated and the numbers don't, don't work out. Um, so I think the fact that they're thinking about this stuff early on is really encouraging. And um, maybe to the second half of the question about what would I like to see more of, um, I think there's, there's a lot of room for info sharing here in ways that help smaller companies combat kind of known bad actors or networks of bad actors or a type of bad action that we're worried about. Um, culture changes so quickly and, and uh, suddenly words mean things they didn't mean a, a year ago or even a month ago. And if there's trends happening on one company, that, on one platform that that company can help educate other companies about, I think there might be more efficient ways to kind of shut down hate speech and harassment and that kind of stuff um, if everyone worked together a little bit more, which is maybe a naive and unsatisfactory answer. Thank you, Kate. Uh, there's two really important themes that I would like to pick out from that. Um, one is around the theme of collaboration, which we don't have nearly enough time to do proper justice to, but it certainly was poppied up in my head a lot through all of these comments, right? The more that we can try to create a space for effective collaboration and exchanging notes here, I think we can really make a lot of progress together. It's just such a difficult thing to do, particularly for, for the headline effect that, that happens whenever any sort of bad thing happens here. Um, but I want to go in the other direction, uh, and mostly because this just feels like one of the harder and, and more difficult to tackle uh, questions in the space right now. There's a big difference between large and small platforms. To what extent does it make sense to actually create that differentiation when we look at regulation and the, the way the government looks at this? So the European Union has already very much gone down this path. The, the Digital Services Act that was introduced last year has a specific new category of very large online platforms that has a, a separate set of, of regulatory burdens that's imposed upon that. I, I uh, genuinely see um, plenty of reasons to do this and plenty of concerns that can come from it. And, and now in the US, we've seen the House Judiciary Committee start to make such distinctions, not in this space, but in the competition space. I would love to hear your reactions. Don't I don't need a yes or no, like this is categorically, like there's, this is a complex space. What kinds of benefits or risks come up in your mind when you think about really making a distinction like that, not in the practices, best practices, or how we try to make harm, but in the role of government and regulation in making a, an explicit distinction like that? Um, I can hey, go please. first uh, as the small business person. Um, I think we always say good policy shouldn't need carve outs. Um, if you're writing good policy, it shouldn't matter kind of who it applies to because it should be uh, navigable for anyone. And uh, that's, I get it, that's really hard to do in this specific area, but that should still be the goal. Um, also, size thresholds can create kind of weird disincentives for growth, um, especially when it's user-based. I think that's a really strange way to measure a company's ability to engage with the content those users create. You can have a very small company with a lot of users, especially like, you know, if, if an app or platform or something goes viral. Uh, and at the same time, you can have a small company with very few users who are letting very bad things happen on their platform. Um, so it, it feels pretty arbitrary. And I'm not entirely sure outside of kind of isolating the four companies that everyone's mad at, what it accomplishes. Um, so we're generally very wary of size thresholds as an organization um, and would rather kind of see common sense policies that a company doesn't have to worry they're gonna butt up against the day that their app goes viral in the app store or something. Um, so yeah, that's that's a concern. I understand the impulse and I, I appreciate that um, and certainly appreciate efforts to kind of protect startups from um, downstream effects, but I, I think better policies would probably be a better answer. This, this is a trend that I think we see across a variety of different types of legislation. Chris, you mentioned it in the antitrust context. In the antitrust context, I think, size matters sort of by definition. And so it's appropriate at least to, I think, think about it in that context. I don't think all the size thresholds in antitrust legislation necessarily are the right ones, but that seems like the size of a company is connected to the policy realm that um, the, 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 the legislative effort that um, that is trying to address a particular issue. And so it seems appropriate. I, it does not seem like policy best practice to me to run into a political issue like this is going to have a harmful effect on millions of different companies. And then to use a carve out to circumvent it, you were joking about um, a theme park 
um, in, in online um, speech legislation uh, at the outset. That happened because legislation ran into a political issue and just did a carve out to try to walk around that issue. That doesn't seem like best practice generally, and particularly in this area where I think those carve outs aren't in any way really connected to the harm. So it's not clear to me that the things that we're worried about that I think Lauren was so articulate, it was so articulate in talking through, you know, harm to communities that are vulnerable, um, online speech that is really deeply problematic. That is not about the size of the company. Um, Parler is a much smaller than Facebook and much smaller, smaller than Twitter. I think it's appropriate to have concerns about content on Parler, just like we might have concerns about content on Twitter. The, the things that are motivating policy solutions here don't seem tied to the size of the company. And therefore, I think for all the reasons that Kate was describing, it would be appropriate to think more deeply, as you and our street are doing, about what the right mechanisms might be that might actually be good for the internet overall, as opposed to designed to take a, a bite out of a small number of firms. Just to build on that a little bit, I think that what Matt was talking about earlier too is you know, essentially asking the question, what are we solving for here? If this is content management, that's a very, very different um, you know, set of policies that probably make sense as opposed to competition or, or even things like liability and transparency. Now, of course they're interconnected. Having said that, you know, I think, um, I think that there's benefit in looking at uh, resourcing, you know, resources that platforms or other, um, you know, technology companies have in order to be able to uh, adhere to new regulatory requirements, respond to, um, you know, other challenges. So to me, you know, you know I, I understand and I absolutely agree that if we're talking about harm mitigation from a, from a content management and policy standpoint, I think Kate said it really well, um, that you shouldn't need carve outs for that. And at the same time, um, you know, when it comes to transparency or competition, you want to you want to keep uh, a space for robust innovation and growth and understand that there are constraints there. Whereas companies that are making billions of dollars in revenue or hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue might be able to more easily generate a, a robust transparency report, uh, maybe should have a couple more requirements when it comes to anti competitive practices. So I think it's about breaking down the space and what the goal is. Uh, and then going from there for size. I think that all is very, very helpful, particularly this distinction between size and harm, as well as just the practical matters here. And, and I started my career um, as an attorney in the Federal Communications Commission actually some time ago now, and definitely did my share of regulatory flexibility act analyses. So to I'm sure the many other people in the call who have had to go through that, you have to go through quite a number of structured exercises according to existing American law in certain contexts to make sure that you're not putting undue regulatory burden on small businesses in particular. So um, while not a major feature of American law at this point in time, I think that uh, Matt's point as well, that it is, uh, it is of growing interest um, is, is accurate and, and something worthy of further uh, discussion in, in much more depth. But let's change topics for now, as there's a, a lot of things that we could spend our time well uh, digging into here. I'd love to dig into, there are a lot of themes in these seven proposals, and, and they've been teed up a little bit more. Uh, so, so to pick one that I think is very, very interesting, and also to reference, um, Lauren used the phrase content management, which is a phrase I've been trying to use a lot as well. It's not quite the same thing as content moderation. And I think that that switch in terminology reflects this greater richness of, it's not just to take down content or put content up, it's a much richer landscape of mitigation and well management than that. So we have a couple of pieces in what we've put together thus far that look at the role played by automation and recommendation engines and the work and the experimentation that has been referenced already to sort of modify these systems in socially responsive ways through intentional changes. I would love to get uh, reactions to um, whether more investment in this space, set aside the role of government and regulation for now, whether you see more and more investment in experimentation with weightings and transparency in recommendation engines and other automated systems, whether you see a lot of potential for that um, to result in improvement to the quality of online life, or whether you see risks in that to create harmful consequences, whether intended or not. That was a lot, sorry, long question. Um, feel free to just say automation recommendation engines, hot, talk, hot take reactions uh, are welcome as well. Otherwise, maybe we can go in reverse order and get Lauren's take first and then to Matt and Kate, and then we'll go back through that way. No problem. Thanks, Chris. Um, in short, yes, I think it's incredibly important to further examine and focus on the role that automation recommendation systems play. 
Um, I mean, a couple more statistics because that's what ADL loves. We put out uh, we put out a report in February 2021 regarding YouTube's role in amplifying extremist content. Nearly one in 10 participants viewed at least one video from a channel identified as extremist or white supremacist. In the, in the online hate and harassment survey we put out, 77% of Americans said that they think laws need to be made to hold social media platforms accountable for recommending users join extremist groups. And these stats don't surprise me because I think that there is an understanding of the role that kind of looping back to what I said in the beginning, platforms are playing in that normalization and that amplification and front and centering of hate and harm. Again, we're not gonna mitigate it completely, but the fact that it's on the front page and the fact that vulnerable individuals can either be targets or be um, you know, radicalized, fall prey to, become influenced by this type of content, I think that does have a lot to do with AI and recommendations. I think that, you know, that ecosystem and the idea that um, staying on a platform for as long as possible really is good for a company's business model. Now, I'm not saying that that's the decision making that platforms you know, are operating under, but, but that the idea that recommending content and looking at waiting and considering maybe even from um, an, an ethicist or a social scientist or a social work or a DEI or anti-racist standpoint, what are we waiting? What are we prioritizing? And when somebody enters the platform, what are we serving up and why? I think those questions are really important. And again, I think that this is especially where, um, you know, outside of, of, of a government framework, but really incentivizing um, the industry to, to invest in that could have great, great impact on users. Um, so I'm pausing in part because this is a topic um, I don't feel like I have a well-formed view on, and I, but I really like the idea of probing deeper into it because I think there's a lot to explore. Um, so I think first, the trend at large companies is certainly to do more and more automation. Um, I think Facebook and Google both have been very public about the percentage of content that they remove via automation versus via user reports. And that percentage has gone from like, you know, 5% six years ago to 90 plus percent or something now. It, it, it's sort of a dramatic change. And I think that means it probably is quite a useful tool in many circumstances. I have been very skeptical about it, um, I, I, I guess, for um, one reason. Um, that I'd love to hear Kate's view on, and, and then one additional reason. Um, the, the first is that it's not clear to me that that's a tool that most companies are able to use. You need large engineering teams to build really smart AI systems. I think ideally that would be available to anyone, and I assume that there are startups in, in Kate's network that can do it as well, or, or, or maybe capable of doing it as well, or better than a company like Google and Facebook, and we want to encourage that kind of competition and content moderation to see who could build the best systems for moderating or managing content as effectively as possible. But it does seem to me to be heavier weight and more difficult for smaller firms to have the more unlikely that smaller firms will have the resources to really be able to compete with large companies in this area. The second is I think it's just hard to know uh, what it does and what whether it works well. And, and I'm skeptical of kind of the idea of like, um, I know it's very difficult to be transparent in a way that people would view as sufficient from a transparency perspective about things like algorithms. It's very hard to figure out how to tell that story effectively. So I'm not necessarily sure that I, I wouldn't say that I fault companies for being insufficiently transparent about their automated removals. Um, but despite that, I don't think we really know that much about it. And it would be very helpful to understand what are the error rates, what kind of content um, is removed more aggressively? Does that have differential impacts across different types of communities? And to learn more about this practice in a way that I think is actually very hard to do before we start saying that it's the solution. Yeah, and just chiming in. I, so Matt's totally right. Uh, for the most part, startups don't have the $100 million that you know Google took to build Content ID, right? Which is a different context, but a similar kind of tool. And I think when thinking about kind of the role of technology either in amplifying content or in removing content, um, it's there's so many important questions to ask, like how is the technology being trained? What are the data sets being fed into it? Where are the data sets coming from? Hasn't it been tested on? Like, I think there's a lot of really important ethical techno technological questions to ask there. Um, but I also think there's kind of a, a like layer of usefulness that um, it's really easy to skim over. And I mean, the internet, right, without, without algorithms, the internet's 
too much. Uh, there's, and there's too many people on Facebook and too many things in Google search results. And it's actually really useful to have some kind of sorting and removal and, and does it always get it right? Of course not. And are there harms? Of course there are. Um, but a lot of the amplification is, um, uh, it's unintentional or, or like the, the actual content that is amplified is not, um, you know, it's not somebody saying this is really valuable. We want more of this. It's kind of, uh, feeding back what it, you know, what it was taught that people want to see. And so the same, the same tools that recommend extremist groups, which of course can be tailored and should be fixed also recommend like the knitting group that my mother has joined on Facebook. And it's hard, it's hard to, it's never going to work perfectly and, and should it be fixed? Yes. But I think kind of the, the underlying assumption that all amplification is harmful is, is probably missing some of the important context and, and the internet without, without some technological pushing would be, um, would be too much for most people to navigate. And I think there's, there are ways to fix it, but it does have an important role to play. Can I Thank jump you. in just for uh, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, think that, I think that Kate's exactly, exactly right. No one's worried that, you know, somebody's recommending me a swimsuit for my vacation or my mom, a, you know, a cat video because it makes her laugh and she clicked on it two weeks ago. No one is worried about that. And I think you're exactly right. That's why there is a need for automation. And I think that parsing out what's being recommended, what's being taken down, what are the different harms there? So for what's being recommended, can we tweak or can we look at waiting? Can we look at um, algorithms and figure out, you know, how can we not worry about or push aside the problem, the not problems, but the realities of cat videos, too many knitting videos, or too many, uh, you know, recipe challenges, but how can we actually tweak and decrease harm and hate and racism and extremism? And then when it comes from a content uh, moderation, and I'll use that word specifically standpoint, I think that's where a lot of the questions about inequity and about what's being taken down, um, that should absolutely be uh, left up and, and who is being impacted, whose speech is being, uh, you know, suppressed in some way that completely doesn't align with A, platform's policies, but B, the way platform, platform policy should be. So I think you're exactly right that the idea that algorithms are evil or that automation is problematic, that needs to go by the wayside, but really to dig deeper into, okay, we're, we're taking that aside. Well, what is problematic? What is fueling extremism, radicalization, hate, racism? And can we tweak that? And that's where I think transparency and looking into these, you know, as detailed as possible. You're never going to know an exact algorithms equation, of course, but we can go a level of, of abstraction deeper. And I think we should. Fantastic. I'm going to ask one final question and then I will be looking to the Q&A, though I always have more. But if anyone uh, in the audience wants to ask a question of our panelists, now is a great time to start typing that up there. Um, I see a couple of sort of themes emerging here, one around the, the positive gains that we might be able to build through greater collaboration among participants in the space, creating more of a, of a shared space and a safe space to learn and share from each other's best practices, maybe build tools together. I'm hopeful uh, that, that uh, ongoing efforts like the um, Trust and Safety Professional Association of the TSPA will help get us some measure down that road. That's only going to get us so far, and there's a different, very uh, significant category that we've started to talk about a little bit around incentives, and where incentives may not be properly aligned for various reasons, and, and places where there are tensions that seem really traceable back to uh, things that can't be solved as easily collaboratively. So to that end, I wanted to ask a little bit more about this um, proposal for consideration in, in our streets work thus far around friction creating more friction in the use of these platforms. Again, let's set aside the role of government here and just imagine as a sort of a best practice. Where do you see opportunities or risks um, in platforms creating more friction, whether in how users engage? So I'm, I'm thinking of the uh, some of the interstitials that, that Twitter, for example, has, has popped up to say, hey, do you want to click on that link before you retweet it to actually see what's in there before you amplify it? Um, or there can be friction in commercial transactions just to sort of segue into that. How do you distinguish organic from commercial speech as well? Um, thoughts on friction and, and the roles and risks that, that can come from that would be, would be great. I could maybe start with a great. probably very obvious observation, but um, I do worry. I think friction has an important role to play. And I, you know, I, I too get the notification on Twitter if I'm doing something stupid. Uh, so I appreciate that. But I think for startups, right, like friction's bad. Um, making your service harder for people to use is not going to attract more users. Um, we have a startup in the network that kind of their whole thing is um, collect collaborative fact checking, but that it, it's more nuanced than that, but encourages people to kind of um, 
have a dialogue when there is a news article or an opinion piece or something on the platform that people disagree with. And I think it's, it's almost like the opposite of friction. Um, and it contributes to these really engaged conversations because people, right, it's, it's not kind of the cesspool of the internet. It's people who want to have these debates, these like intellectual academic like debates. Um, and so in some ways, introducing friction there might discourage participation, especially right of people who have maybe different diverse experiences or, or viewpoints. Um, but I, I do appreciate that there are plenty of places where friction is good. I think just as like a friction blanket over the whole internet would probably be uh, harmful for some of the startups we work with. You're really pouring cold water on my friction as a service startup idea here, Kate. Thanks. Thanks. For it that. probably has a role to play, just not not all over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have such a startup, Master Shu. Uh, Lauren and Matt would love other thoughts. Yes, please. Yeah. Well, earlier Kate mentioned, you know, how privacy by design really started to take off and, and the benefits of that. And I think if there was, you know, anti-hate or anti-harm by design, then we would probably hone in on where friction is good and where friction is problematic both generally speaking, but also certainly for innovation and startups. I, unsurprisingly, I think there's a lot of good that can be done um, in the world of friction, but not to the detriment of the creation of robust conversations or, um, you know, the the creation of new technology, right? Or, or, or and I think that, and I'm not going to get into this too deeply, but I think that's the same for uh, deep fake technology. A lot of people think deep fakes are evil in and of themselves. There's a lot of amazing innovation going on in the healthcare world and in the creative world regarding it. So again, when we're talking about um, a fix to you know, friction overall or some particular product or um, or change, I think, yes, any blanket statement is, is by and large not going to be helpful. Um, I think friction certainly with uh, reporting features. Um, sorry, let, let's back that up a minute. I think friction with behavior can be really helpful. Again, building into the anti hate by design, because it really it doesn't get at content moderation specifically, but instead looks at behaviors and says, okay, where can we build something in to make somebody take a step back? Where is the UX unhelpful? And where is it helpful? And then another another area of not friction but potential like product changes is how can we take away friction for reporting so an individual who is experiencing campaign harassment we don't want them to have to report every single piece of content we want them to be able to batch that content or if somebody has um, an intimate image that has been posted without their uh, consent online. Can we have product features that take away the friction of them having to take down each piece to the puzzle? So I think we have to look at friction critically and say, you know, when do we want to put something in the process and, and make it harder to do something based on behaviors that we know, based on anti-hate practices, but then when do we want to make it easier and, and intentionally take away friction that's already built into the platform and is not helping? I agree completely with what um, with how uh, Kate and Lauren have responded. To say it a little bit provocatively, I think friction can actually be a form of censorship. If you make it harder for people to speak and they end up not speaking or say less, that functions as a form of censorship. We might decide that the benefits of that friction or the, um, the benefits of the censorship, the benefits of not speaking outweigh the harms. But I think it's useful to think about in those terms. Chris, I think the way that you frame the conversation is really interesting because thinking about it as like a regulatory move, for instance, I think might be problematic, even if it were to survive First Amendment scrutiny. But I think what you proposed of friction as a service seems really useful. I think it would be great if there were uh, there was a startup that provided friction as a service and certain companies decided that that was a, a valuable service to provide to their users. And then they adopted that technology and implemented more friction. And if more people liked that product experience because it felt safer or like better content and that created more competitive pressure on certain companies and then led to those companies adopted some adopting some form of that of that friction that seems to me to be a positive development using um the product experience and competition in the market to test the proposition of whether friction is actually something that users want thanks and that's a great segue um, we don't have any uh, q a entries yet probably everyone is busy filling out that form that i dropped a link to in the chat uh, to provide their own input into this process but lauren i'll go ahead and let you jump in and then i can segue us into another direction as a group perfect i did just want to respond quickly and i don't disagree with matt that friction you know could certainly be a form of censorship but i i would be remiss if i didn't point out that you know, harassment and harm is absolutely a form of censorship. So individuals who are the bene beneficiaries is, is completely the wrong word, are the recipients 
of the lack of friction when it comes to harm and hateful content are driven off the platform and aren't able to engage in speech in and of itself. So I agree with you that we have to weigh the benefits and the costs of both. Because you know we want to create environments where people can speak freely on on both sides of the coin. You know how easy is it to enter the platform from where you sit? So I completely agree. Just wanted to point that little um, you know piece of nuance there. Can I jump in with sure. one point, Chris? Sorry, I think yeah, another, absolutely. The other thing about friction is it also opens another vector for companies to get things wrong. Um, so like the big story on TikTok right now, right, is that if if creators were entering things like Black Lives Matter, they were being blocked from um, posting. Uh, on the platform where something like white lives matter which you know has no place on TikTok uh, as a thing to create around um wasn't being blocked and it's you know TikTok has come out and said we didn't do this on purpose we just were trying to build in friction to help people be safe on here and we got it wrong and so to matt's numerator point i think increasing or introducing friction also creates more opportunities for the numerator problem to increase because uh somebody's going to get it wrong technically or morally or, or somewhere in between so but is that friction or is that AI? Like that's where I'm not sure when I think of friction and, and again, maybe this gets to definitions, right? Like what are we, I think of product features to slow on the user side, as opposed to, um, you know, build AI or ML systems that create, actually take, that I would argue is probably not friction. And again, it, it gets to the definition. I think the point is incredibly well taken. And of course we had major problems with what we saw um, on TikTok with exactly that. Um, but I just wonder if it's if that's ML systems that are um, you know biased by design as a you know and and what are you know what are what's the data that's feeding those systems to create that outcome as opposed to friction? I'm not sure, but that's sort of where my dream. When I think of friction, I think of um, something I heard from an academic soon after I started working in the tech sector, which was the idea of introducing friction by flashing a photo of your mother right as you were about to post on social media, which seems like fantastically good uh, friction and maybe not for some, maybe it's a wonderful product experience for many people. Uh, I think for others, it probably wouldn't be. And that's, I, I mean, it's sort of a comical example, although it was actually raised seriously. Um, but I think it's, it, 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 um, it sort of showcases that, you know, there may be downsides to friction in terms of having the product experience that we'd want to have. Many ways responding to the old adage on the internet, no one knows your dog, except now we're all on video calls. And so I think people kind of do, uh, Snapchat filters aside. Um, I wanna talk about one last point and, and, sh and segue a little bit away from the, what can we all uh, do with, with, without government to one of the areas that is very, very much a centerpiece of potential government intervention here, which is around um, disclosure and, and content policies uh, both in the granular sense and in the individual and in the overall policy sense. What do you see as the possibilities for greater uh, granularity in content policies, greater specificity in order to create more predictability, which then has that trade-off in um, potential for rigidity and for lack of ability of providers to deal with and respond to harm as it occurs, um, as well as the notices that users get after a, a content moderation or, or management action has taken place as it affects them. Uh, this is a space we haven't talked that much about today, so I'd love to get reactions to that. And, and uh, it's been a balanced conversation thus far, so I'm not going to pick on anyone. I'll let whoever wants to go first, please go. I love, I love this idea. I think anything that's focused on user agency and user education is a fantastic one. Companies have been struggling with this forever. I think that more granularity tends to mean more complex, more difficult to understand, more simplicity means you leave out certain key points. And I think a lot of the questions around content moderation are ultimately optimally solved by user education and people really understanding what they what they do online, how it can be harmful, how people would experience those harms. I don't think people sort of set out, most people don't set out, I think, wanting to create evil or pain in the world. And I think better education probably is the route to getting there. I think the problem is it's really hard to do that in practice. And so even though I think in a in theory, that probably is the way to address lots of the harms that we see online. I don't know if we've come up with a scalable model for really educating users in concrete specific ways that leads to changes in user behavior. So if someone like R Street can crack this nut, I think that is a that is a gift for the world. Um, but um, but I think it's really hard to do. Just jumping in first, I, I, I agree. It's an incredibly hard balance. I think there are some very um, quick and easy ways that I that I that I think we can get to a better place for user understanding 
First is literal languages on the platform. We know that, you know, for example, Facebook uh, supports over, I think, 111, but, but I know that there are you know, almost 30 more widely spoken languages on the platform. But I'm pretty sure that the community guidelines are only posted in less than 50 of those. So can we just get an understanding from a language perspective? Can we get consistency there? So people even know the guidelines. So that's not even a granularity issue. That's literally a, a user education issue. I think that's a really important one. And then in addition to granularity, I agree that it's, you know, what's too much, what's too little. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet with the calculus, but I do think that exceptions and understanding um, rules and the prevalence of exceptions in those rules, because we know that they exist, is incredibly important and can help users. And then finally, Chris, what you mentioned is um, education for when something's taken down or something's appealed or somebody is reporting something. I think that level of communication can certainly increase. And we know working with a lot of individuals who are you know, targets of harassment or alternatively who feel like they aren't able to put out what they need to on the platform because of inequities and because of um, bias through policy and product deserve an answer as well. So I think we can do a couple of things right now and then we can get at a better you know, middle ground for granularity. And Kate, if I could ask you to sort of weave a final word into this as well, and then we'll give a brief chance to Lauren and Matt for any final words as well. Please yeah, just, answer in, in, in. thanks, Kate. Um, on theme of everything I've said, I think um, transparency and granularity and simplicity will have to vary company to company. Uh, if you have a company that has like you know user generated takedowns like a Reddit or a Wikipedia, that's a transparency report looks very different than a company like Facebook. Um, and of course, a a startup's ability to to navigate that at all is is very dependent on the company. Um, so I think it's it's one of those things that sounds great in practice and, and probably would be good for users at raw at large, but um, it's hard to it's hard to actually get nailed down um, and is often thought about in the context of Facebook, but there's a lot more internet out there than just Facebook. And any other final words, but that is a good one to land on Kate for if there's a lot more to the internet than Facebook. So maybe I'll just segue to Matt if he has a final thought and then to Lauren to, to wrap us up. Uh I just, again, I really appreciate that you're convening um, this conversation and other conversations because it does feel to me like learning as much as we can is going to be a helpful route to coming up with a better path. Uh, I'll echo that. Thanks. I think that, you know, folks that are in this industry really want to work hard together. There are shared goals. There's ideas of how we get there that differ, but I am starting to see more and more, you know, agreement and, and that's a good thing. And I think we need to work towards um, you know, a really whole of industry and society and government approach, not every piece to that puzzle is going to be appropriate for, you know, being the, the uh, most aggressive actor in creating a better and safer internet. But we are, I'm optimistic, we are moving in a direction um, where I think that there's a much better understanding of what we can and can't do and how we need to break down this, like, this big internet thing so that we can better understand the ecosystem and how it impacts people. Thanks again. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you. I share your optimism, uh, despite the complexity and the challenge of all these problems. And thank you so much to, to Kate, Matt, and to Lauren for the stimulating conversation and really rich discussion of these very complex themes. And uh, this recording will be available in due course on the R Street website. Thank you to the participants and uh, happy Wednesday, everyone. Take care. Thanks a lot, Chris.